Welcome to part two of Python and SQL. My name is Brian Kafferke. Again, the content, if you watch the first one, content is always going to be on github.com slash bkafferke slash shared. We're going to dig in in this particular episode with a little more depth. Um, I did mention my other video. I'm going to think skip over it this time, but I developed content for Microsoft Learn and it's on the Microsoft Learn platform. And if you look on there, you find all kinds of online training resources. It's gamified, so you get all kinds of awards. There's questions. You can often interact with assets in Azure, so you can create things like virtual machines in Azure and stuff without paying anything. You just get to explore and have fun with it. It's growing all the time, too. A lot of good content. The content I developed is focused on data science, so I hope you like it. If you just filter on the data scientist role, then you'll find all the content that I was responsible for, so hope you like it. Jumping in here, in the last episode, I feel like one of those TV shows, Ballast Episode, still drinking out of my Enterprise mug. And what else? Uh, wearing my window shirt. So last episode, we talked about the simplest, most direct way to jump in and use SQL with Python. In this chapter, I want to get into a somewhat more robust approach. And it's using what I mentioned was automatically given to you as part of Python, which is SQLite. So what do we get if we use this approach? Well, for one thing, as I mentioned, it's batteries included. SQLite is something you automatically get. SQLite is really cool because you get a client-side relational database system that you can use. So you can do all kinds of querying and things. And there's tools you can get that will actually visualize the SQLite tables and things. So it, it feels a lot like something like having SQL Server or Oracle on your machine, but it's it doesn't have a, an advanced cataloging system of storing tables and compressed formats, et cetera, and having like all these backup recovery things that typical databases would have. So it's really designed to be just a lightweight database, which is great for like web applications if they're gonna have a client side and they need to be able to store data and they can access it there, or maybe web apps, um, excuse me, mobile apps might use it or something. But it's also really great for having that available that we can use for data analysis because it's already installed. So again, the batteries included, it's a um, fully functional database has good SQL support, so we've got nice SQL. We can do the sort of outer joins and things we talked about earlier. It's great for local application or analysis work. So let's take a look at it. So I'm gonna pop over again to a Jupyter Notebook, and this is all available out on their GitHub, and the batteries included is there. So first thing I'm gonna do a little different than just leveraging pandas this time. We're gonna use SQLite this way, and we can check out like what version do we have, et cetera, using this method. And again, I put links in here wherever I got things when I'm playing with things. This is the SQLite uh, link, their, uh, their website to get documentation. You can find more stuff here. A lot of good documentation out there. So searching with Bing or Google, you find a lot of good stuff. So let me just run that. Again, using Jupyter Notebooks. If you have not used Jupyter Notebooks, I have a video on that. Lots of stuff online. Look at it. If you're a Python person and you maybe don't use Jupyter, it's basically what used to be called IPython. IPython is still available, but IPython is specific to Python. It's a it's a great tool. So it was turned into a browser-based console that supports multiple languages using a kernel architecture, and that is Jupyter Notebooks. Okay, so we can see what versions we have here. That's great. Now, one of the things we need to do, whenever you're going to use a database system, you need to establish a connection to it. Database systems are designed with the idea that the database is somewhere else, not here, it's over there somewhere, and we need to establish a network connection to it. So that's the first thing. Now SQLite, it is local, but we can connect to other databases with it. And so we use this SQLite connect here. Now remember we pulled in SQLite here, so we didn't give it an alias in this case, so we're just gonna use the entire name of the library dot connect. And here we're saying memory. So what we're doing is we're saying we're just going to play with things in memory. We're not actually connecting to a pre-existing database. So let's run that. And now we have this DB object, which is our connection. Another thing that's common in a database is something called a cursor. A cursor, the origins of that name is really kind of like, you think of a cursor on your screen. You keep it here, you move down, you move down. The real origins, I believe, of the, the term cursor is from the idea that you would retrieve data out of a SQL table and you get rows back. And the cursor is designed to step through those rows. So give me the first row, then the next row, then the next row. So you can process it, so you can do things, so you display, etc. But we're gonna use cursor, or it is actually used in this context in a broader means. A cursor is just 
a way to execute statements against the database, not all of which are going to return results. So we can see here we're creating a cursor, which is using the DB connection we created up here. And that'll give us that back. So let's run that. And let me, let me just, just for the heck of it, I don't know what it will show us. It, it shows us basically this is just a reference to an object. Okay, so nothing fancy we can see there. Now with that cursor, which is again, connecting back to now what we have is an in-memory database. So it's kind of, it's connecting to memory. There's nothing there yet. So we're gonna execute some SQL statements. I'm gonna go create some a table and then kind of see what we can do. So we're gonna execute this SQL statement, which is going to create a table called books. And that books is gonna have a column called ID, which is a primary key. It's gonna create a t uh, title column, an author column, and a price column. And all of these, you know, are all text, which means it's just strings of data. And we're gonna commit. Another concept with databases, you can do a lot of work, but it actually won't execute anything until you say commit. Now, typically this is with updates you think of commit. So you you have a row of data, you update it, you update another. Now you might think, well, as soon as I update the row, just save it to the database. Unfortunately, that becomes very poor in performance. If you had millions of rows, can you imagine something like Amazon and they're updating a database and they're trying to update so much. Every time you commit, you free up resources. You you have to open up, uh, you close the logs out that are tracking these changes so they can be backed off, etc. So commits are, really heavy in terms of the resource consumption. So if you know you're in there and you're gonna be updating a lot of rows, it's a lot more efficient to do a multiple updates at one time and then commit it together. And it's a balancing act, TBAs will be sure to help you with that, but it's a balancing act of how many rows you should batch up before you commit. And sometimes another reason for commits is you're updating five different tables and there's a relationship between them. I've added the person's account, or say their name and their account, I've added some rows of detail that are say in an order and I've got other things and I want to make sure that when I save it all of it goes together because it's a complete picture of this order if I lost any one of them it's useless to me so basically it's all or nothing so that's another reason for a commit now there is a broader sense of a commit here in the tense in this sense we're going to create a table so we're saying create the table without the commit it's just kind of waiting it's pending it's saying let me know when you're ready to go you know, you kind of use a coffee mug, coffee mug analogy. You know, you say, say when. Uh, that's kind of the idea. Commit is when you say when, stop, execute, commit. A lot of things around the commit in a typical database. So we're going to run this, and this will actually create a table for us in SQLite. And then what we're going to do is insert some rows of data here. So plug in my data for PowerShell, PowerShell for, for database developers. But anyway, let's uh, run that, and that's committed also. And finally, we'll do is like a print. And so what we can do is we now are executing. So you can see all these things are executing. And each time we're done, we commit. Right. And we've inserted some data. And now we're going to say, OK, I want to just select some data from this. And I'm going to use this method fetch all. There's a bunch of fetch methods. I'm not going to get into all of them in this real quick demo. But you can do fetch one. You can do fetch, uh, fetch all, et cetera. There's a bunch of them. So this will retrieve all of the rows of data. In this case, there's only two, so not a risk of uh, over overdoing things. We're gonna commit it so we get the result and then we can print it and we can see here that we get the results back. Now, interestingly, we did not get the results back as a pandas data frame. We haven't even imported pandas yet, so we really couldn't, uh, but you can see we're getting a list. You can tell because of these square brackets, that's a list. All right, so we can also confirm this by just doing a type on that object. You know, it went into list books and we printed that uh, we can see that it is in fact a list. That's nice. Unfortunately, lists aren't terribly easy to work with when you're doing like data analysis. You wanna really work with data frames. So let's see if we can improve this situation. We're gonna use SQLite again. We're gonna use a different method. We're gonna use pandas with SQLite this time. And we're gonna say PD read SQL query from books. And notice we're giving it the DB connection. So this connection here is really important because that's getting us back to this. And that's the memory connection. It could be a physical database, all right? So just bear in mind. In this case, it's just memory and we create our tables and stuff. So when we run this SQL statement, it's going to run this select using that connection. So does that mean that pandas is SQLite aware? Yes, it is. And that's really good for us. So we can now return that and I purposely prefix it with DF. DF meaning data frame. And let's see what happens here. And this time, we get a nicely formatted 
data frame back that we can query and you notice we can even do the head statement. So we've got panda support, but we're querying against the SQLite database. So this is kind of where you get the best of both worlds. You can use all the features of SQLite, but you can also use a lot of stuff with pandas to make it easier to work with for analysis. Now I'm going to just use the cursor to drop the table and again commit and then I'll execute and just to prove that it really dropped our table I'm going to try to select against it and see if it works and of course I get an error no such table so it's gone all right now I'm going to show you a few other things here and there's a cool thing I'm a big fan of if you can get a demo database like Microsoft has AdventureWorks and SQLite has this thing called Chinook and Chinook is basically a a book kind of model lets you do demos can kind of do more elaborate things when you're trying to show things and this is a, a link to getting the Chinook and the sample database in SQLite you can see it's got a hierarchy of tables this is typical of a relational database design so you can kind of see really at the heart of it all is is the songs you've got genres though hanging off the songs what genre does this belong to the artists go to albums so tracks go to albums albums go to artists so you can see all these different tables so what we're going to do is, I downloaded, I followed the instructions on that link and brought in Chinook. Um, I can connect to Chinook, and Chinook is actually sitting, let me see if I can prove something to you here, but if I just do PD, uh, yeah, let me do something else. LS, you can see that there's the Chinook database. It's sitting on the default folder where I'm sitting. So this is why this will work for me. And I can say connect to the Chinook DB. And this is in the format needed by SQLite. And then I can create a cursor for it, connection cursor. Again, the, connect, the cursor is really just a place where I can execute my statements. It's an object I put my statements in and run them. And then here you can see I'm going to execute from the cursor. I'm selecting data from it. I'm ordering by title. And then I can print it out. Now. I'm actually intentionally going to get this back uh, in albums and let's run that. And again, I'm not doing anything with data frames yet. So I just want to demonstrate the data is there. I can get at it. Again, if I run this, I see it's a list. So now let's go back. I'm going to use this. Imagine this is a more robust thing. I've got a SQLite database. It could even be other types of things like a Postgres database, as we'll see. And I want to query it. So I'm going to bring in SQLite and pandas. And then I'm going to say I'm going to create a data frame, and then I'm going to use the pandas function read SQL query. There's one also read table, I believe, read SQL table, which just brings in an entire table. I prefer the query because then I can always select the table if I want, uh, or I can pick the columns. Notice we have a connection, so that's going to that's what gets us to our database, Chinook, and we can run this and let's see what we get. So we get a nice little table again. We can query, and I can you know do anything I want with this now keep referencing that connection. Now, bear in mind, the connection represents a, an, an object that's open and bringing you a relationship to that database. There are resources being tied up while you do that. It's okay, but as I'll show you at the end, you want to close those out. If this were like you know, SQL Server, DBAs would not like it if you left connections open. But here we're going to run this statement. And this is just, this time I just want to pull out the name where the type is, a table, so it's giving me a list of tables. So this is where uh, basically the catalog apparently in SQLite is kept and you can get object lists, etc. query the catalog. So you hit this time, I'm going to do a table list, uh, SQLite master. Oh, I already did this. So I think I'm redundant in that one. I'll skip past that. Uh, but I can, oh, this one. Oh, so here I'm not storing it anywhere. I'm just running it. Here I'm going to take the results back of my catalog query and put it in this df table list and then I can give you a type and you can see it's just an object but I can look at the table list it's now a data frame and that's again because I used the PD read SQL so the main thing here is to uh, partly realize that you can like other databases with SQLite you can query the catalog say what are the table names what's what are the objects etc um, but let's look at something that's more data centric so now we're going to do a query again this time we're going to use things like a substring, and I want to get, because to be honest, the artist was kind of long, so I'm just going to get the first 10 characters. I'm going to rename the column as artist. I'm going to take the title and get the first 15 characters. Substring, you give it the column. It has to be a string column, some sort of character. And starting at 1, a length of 15, and here's my title. And I'm joining 
from albums, I'm going to join artist on the artist ID. So I'm using these aliases. The album's going to be R, artist A. And the reference R is the old days when they had records. Uh, I'm going to join tracks. I'm going to join album ID to album ID between the tables because the IDs are on both. And I'm going to say an order by. And again, I'm going to limit it. And this just gives me the query. I can use the read SQL statement here with that query passed in. And I'll run this. Now, one of the things that's really cool here is if you remember before, in that simplest method, we are just using pandas against data frames. I couldn't really get rid of that index column. But if I say index column here and give it the index I want, it says, okay, that's your index. And it gets rid of the other columns. So we don't have to see it anymore, which I, which I like. I think that's kind of a nice thing. So we're getting some, I think, improvement in our scale here. And we're getting a lot more flexibility in what we do. Because we're really recognizing now we're dealing with a database, not strictly data frames. Now I mentioned when you're done, you want to close things out. So there's a cursor to close and there's a connection to close. So let's get rid of those. And now that's done. The last piece here is that Python has a really neat thing in its batteries included architecture, which it has built in support for open source relational databases such as Postgres and MySQL. I'm a big fan of Postgres. I've done a lot of work with it, and it is a powerful database. It does a lot of great stuff. So I, I, it's really cool because you have direct support. So using, uh, it's built, what you have built in is this driver, SciCobb2. You can also download it if you don't have it for some reason. Uh, I'm going to give that a PG reference. So that's a library that just gives me connectivity to Postgres. By the way, if you do any Django development, et cetera, Postgres has built in support for that as well. So Python seems to favor Postgres over any other database, which is, is pretty cool. Pandas, IO, SQL, here we're going to use. It's a little bit different in PSQL. So this is something that will work with MySQL. It will work with Postgres, and it might work with Oracle. I can't, I don't know. There's a little bit better support in Oracle as well. Uh, PG support. So we're going to say PG connect database name. In this case, it's called development. And then we've got user and password. So real high security here. I'm giving you user ID and password. It's a really bad idea, honestly, to put password in clear text like this. Um, there has to be a better way to encrypt it. I haven't found it yet. I'll show you a better way with, with SQL Server at least because you can use uh, integrated security, which just doesn't require it. It just authenticates you directly. But I just want to show you how you could do something here with Postgres. So if I run this, and it just creates the data frame. So then let me run this. And so I've, I now have taken data out of the person table in Postgres, and I'm able to see it here, which is really good. So as I'm mentioning here, this will not work with SQL Server and a number of other databases. So I'm going to show you in my next discussion how you can work directly with relational database management systems like SQL Server, Oracle, and those kinds of things. But I did want to show you, like, there's some low-hanging fruit here. If you are using Postgres or MySQL, this could be a good option. And again, parsimony, it's like this gets you in quick. It's just a couple of statements, and you're good to go. You don't have to get into anything hairy. This is really pandas-centric. I'm still focused on using data frames because data frames are good for query analysis, etc. Not scalable if you're talking about terabytes of data. So you're going to have to think differently. But you probably, you'd have to approach everything differently once you get into really high volumes of data. Data frames are not going to be an option anymore. You're probably looking at maybe something like Spark or at least pulling data out in chunks to work with. So thank you. Please subscribe. Tell your friends, etc. And until next time.